تغمض عينيك وتذكى تغمض عينيك وتذكر تسبيحا حلوا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد The next chapter is chapter number 27 and it is hadith number 52 The chapter is the excellence of maintaining family ties The narration is the narration of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have relation or I have relatives with whom I maintain connections while they cut me off. I am good to them while they are bad to me. They behave to towards me like fools while I am forbearing towards them. The Prophet ﷺ said, If things are as you have said, it is as if you were putting hot ashes on them and you will not lack a supporter against them from Allah as long as you continue to do that. So a man came to the Prophet wasallam and spoke about the difficult situation that he was facing from his relatives in that he saw himself being good to wait towards them وَأُحْسِنُ إِلَيْهِمْ وَيُسِئُونَ إِلَيْهِ The fact that he mentions أُحْسِنُ إِلَيْهِمْ is this word أُحْسِنُ from وَإِحْسَانُ is just like uh, is like the word بِرْ is a, like a كَلِمُتٌ جَامِعَ it's an encompassing word of, of many types of good that uh, you do towards a person like أَبِرُّ وَالِدَتِي that I'm righteous towards my mother they don't specify exactly what, but just all that would come under towards good, towards them is mentioned here. Where you see una ilay, and that they are, uh, they behave with me in, in a bad way. He continues to, sh to explain, وَيَجْهَلُونَ عَلَيَّ And that they behave towards me like fools, as is translated here. يَجْهَلُونَ from جَهَلَ or from وَجَهَل rather which means to be ignorant. So they will be behaving towards him like from the actions of the ignorant people. And that he said, radiallahu anhu, that I was forbearing and soft towards them. Here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned two things. The first one is that it is, it is, if it is, as you have explained, and that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is hearing essentially one side of the story. And it's important to, to bear that in mind. That those other people whom there is a tuhma, that there is an accusation towards them, they are not there to defend themselves. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did say, لَإِنْ كَانَ كَمَا تَقُولُ If it is as you have explained, then it is or it is like as if you were putting hot ashes on them. Now what does that mean? It means here that number one, continue with your goodness towards them. That your goodness towards them in face of them misbehaving towards you, it is as though that the goodness that you are, good, you are doing to them will cause them to have a punishment. So your good actions towards them, it is that they are harming themselves. And secondly, or based upon that, that your good actions towards them, that they are then harming themselves, like it is your pouring hot ashes on them, I harming them, that you will receive the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, alayhi wa sallam, said, and you will not lack a supporter against them from Allah as long as you continue to do that. Either you will have a'unam min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you will have a help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as long as you continue to do that. Continue to do what? Continue to do good towards them. Continue to <clears throat> show goodness towards them, even though that they misbehave towards you. 
Now, a couple of important points that this is our 27th chapter, okay, and we'll go through many, many more chapters around um, a similar uh, topic. Silatul Rahim, I mean, upholding the, or maintaining family ties. We've spoken about maintaining times with the mother, maintaining ties with the mother, the father, uh, close relatives. I mean, how many chapters or how many titles are you going to uh, write down or how many ahadith are you going to mention about the same point? I mean, how many times do you want to, to drive that point home that you need to maintain ties with, with your family? So we've taken 52 ahadith so far, or 52 ahadith and uh, athar as well. So how many, you know, how many more do we want to to go through to to explain this point? You may find that there's a repetition. Uh, a very similar hadith has been or will be mentioned uh, shortly if we reach it, and we will have mentioned it in, in an earlier chapter. Okay. So why are we then uh, mentioning? The same hadith again. Why? This is because, Wallahu alam, that Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah, if you look at his works, and especially in Sahih al Bukhari, you will find that Imam al Bukhari, before he mentions a hadith, he will mention a chapter title. Okay? He'll give a title, and then he'll mention a hadith or an evidence or an athar which will relate to that particular chapter. So in Sahih al-Bukhari, you may find the same hadith mentioned a number of times, maybe three or four times, the same hadith. But the chapter, the title of the chapter is different. So for example, um, you may find um, one particular hadith, not, not something that comes to my mind at the moment, but there is a hadith talking about, let's say, salah, prayer. Okay. So Imam al-Bukhari puts a chapter talking about uh, the obligation of prayer, and then as a hadith, it is mentioned, and then within that hadith, you find it, you find it later on again, talking about somewhere in, you know, let's say uh, Kitab al-Adab in, the, in the, the chapter of manners, for example. That is because in that hadith, you will find not only talking about the obligation of salah, but will also talk about a matter of manners as well. Okay, that's not a real life example. Just given, you know, uh, an example for us to understand the point that I mentioned. Likewise here that you, you'll, you'll find a title uh, of a chapter talking about Fadl Silat al-Rahim, okay, or as we'll mention shortly, um, okay, in chapter 15, the punishment for disobeying one's parents, okay, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that there is no sin more deserving and its punishment quickened or brought forth quickly for the offender, in addition to what is stored up for him in the hereafter, then zulmu waqiyat al rahim, then oppression and severing of family ties. Now, very shortly, okay, we're going to mention this hadith again, but with a different title of the chapter. So this hadith has a number of benefits, but can be used for different topics. Okay, this is why you find that the hadith can be mentioned more than one place because. It is suitable because there's many benefits in the hadith, so we can therefore use it again. So it's not just uh, merely repeating the hadith for just repeating sake, but we find that there are more than one benefit, there's more than one benefit that we can take from the hadith that is suitable for that title. There was another point, but it, uh, it escapes me, right? Shall I come back? Wait, anyhow, the next hadith. Uh, that is hadith number 53, which is the hadith of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. And the previous hadith is authentic. 53. Abdul Rahman radiallahu anhu ibn Awf, uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah azza wa jal said, I am the merciful, Ar Rahman, and I have created ties of kinship and derived a name for it from my name. Whoever maintained ties of kinship, I maintain ties with him, and I shall cut off. I shall cut off from me whoever cuts them off. This is an authentic hadith as well. This is a hadith in Qudsi, which is clear. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ is saying or said, "This is what Allah said 
So we know this is a hadith from Qudsi. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anur Rahman, which is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Yudulu Ala Rahman, which is a proof for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. That for every name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we derive from it a sifa, an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ar Rahman, if we extract from that, Ar Rahma, and we extract, for example, from Al Aziz, Al Izza, mighty, okay, and the might. Um, Al Hakim, Al Hikmah, wisdom or power, or rule. So from every name, we can extract an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, is a proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatness. Now in the Arab, with the Arabs, in the Arabic language, something that has many names is a proof of its greatness, of its importance. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names. And there is none more important to any of us than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأَنَا خَلَقْتُ الرَّحِمْ That he subhanahu wa ta'ala created الرَّحِمْ He subhanahu wa ta'ala created the ties of kinship and derived a name for it from his name. وَشْتَقْتُ لَهَا مِنْ إِسْمِ And as we mentioned in the previous uh, hadith, that it, it will speak. It will speak on the Day of Judgment, and we'll soon mention as well, that it will complain about those who broke ties with people. And as we will mention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make clear that it will not be satisfied or pleased that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut off those people who cut the kin or the links of kinship. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain ties with those people who maintain kinship. So this uh, chapter, or the name of this is Bad or Fadlu, the virtues of maintaining family ties. What is the excellence, what are the virtues of maintaining family ties? But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I maintain ties with that person who, who maintains ties with their family members. The next hadith in hadith number 54 is Uh, and Abu Al-Ambus, he said, I visited Abdullah ibn Amr at a place called Al-Wahat. Al-Wahat is a place which is uh, landed in, in, in Ta'if. And he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed his finger towards us and said, the root of the word Ar-Rahim is derived from Ar-Rahman. Whoever maintains the connection of ties of kinship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain ties with him. And whoever cuts them off, Allah will cut him off. The kin will have a free and eloquent tongue on the day of rising. So the first part of the hadith we've spoke about in hadith number 53, where the root of the word or the origin of the word Ar-Rahim is derived from Ar-Rahman. And whoever maintains the connection and the ties of kinship, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain ties with that person, and whoever cuts, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut him off. And here is an extra part that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ar-Rahim or laha lisanun talq that the, the Rahim will have a free and eloquent tongue on the day of resurrection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it the ability that it will speak. And it will speak on behalf of those who maintained ties. And it will speak against those who broke the ties of kinship. How is that? Wallahu alam. We don't know the reality of how it will speak, but we accept it. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us of that. And it's an authentic hadith. So on the day of qiyamah, on the day of rising, where everybody will stand for their accounting, there will be a rahim, the kin will be able to speak on behalf or 
or speak for you or will speak against you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us and the Prophet informed us that whoever maintained the connections of ties of kinship, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain it with them. So it shows the importance and the virtues and the excellence of maintaining family ties. And they will serve to benefit you on the Day of Judgment. Next hadith is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the word Rahim is derived from Allah al-Rahman. And whoever maintains the ties of kinship, Allah will maintain ties with him. And whoever cuts them off, Allah cuts them off. And this is from, uh, is the same hadith basically, but just narrated by a different companion here, and Tariq Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So that completes that chapter. The next chapter is chapter 28. Is maintaining the ties of kinship will prolong life. And here there are two narrations. The first one by Anas ibn Mubarak radiallahu anhu. That the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Whoever wishes to have his provision expanded and his term of life prolonged, should maintain ties of kinship. <coughs> and similarly, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever is pleased to have his provisions expanded and his term of life lengthened, should maintain ties of kinship. Okay, now to simplify this matter, how is it that our lives may be extended? If we go back to under, try to understand the knowledge, ilmullah, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has four aspects to it. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has four aspects or four points for us to know. Number one is that there was no beginning. I.e. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that can go back as far as you can go back. It has no beginning. Okay, Allah's knowledge goes back in the past and has no beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew everything. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that is happening now. Thirdly, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that will happen in the future, with no end. And fourthly, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of matters that if they were to occur like that, if it was to happen like that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have knowledge of that. What does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that the disbelievers, that they will they will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return to this worldly life so that they can do good deeds. They will return to this worldly life to do good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that if they were to be returned, that they would return to and go back to the same thing that they did the first time. Now number one, will they ever be returned? No, they won't. They will never have that chance. No one will have that chance to come back. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us of knowledge that if it was to even occur like that, Allah has knowledge of that matter as well. Okay, so these are the four aspects of knowledge concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bearing that in mind, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the khalq, created the creation, 50,000 years, or rather I should say, when everything was written down in the Lawh al mahfuz 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, that all of our ajal, everything that was, who was going to exist, your names, your amar, your, your ages, and everything was there, preserved, put there in the preserved tablet. Okay, your, your age was given, it's written there, fixed age. Now, your life in detail, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know what you are going to do before you do it? Yes. Does Allah, or did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Know even before everything was written, know what you, who you were, what you're going to do, everything. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew all of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that you would be good to your parents. And when you were good to your parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you extra years. And there were even acts of maybe disobedience that maybe took away from your years. So, as we are living now, as we are living now, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that whoever wishes to have his provisions expanded, to have them blessed, to have more of them, and his life uh, lifespan 
to be uh, prolonged, then he should maintain ties of kinship. طيب. Now I'm alive, I'm living my life now. If I'm good to my parents, can I increase my life? Insha'Allah, yes. But does that change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows about us? No, it doesn't. Does that change what is going to be in the, what is already in the law al mahfuz No, it is not. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows that. I don't know that. But because I did this action, it was a reason for my life to be uh, increased. Okay, it's a simple way of looking at inshaAllah. So these two narrations talk about may, um, maintaining the ties of kinship will pres- uh, prolong life. Both hadiths talk about not only you know, extending your life, but also having your provisions or having barakah, having more in your provisions as long as you maintain the ties of kinship. A chapter number 29 is titled, Allah loves the one who maintains his ties of kinship. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Man ittaqa rabbah, that whoever, or if someone fears his Lord and maintains his ties of kinship, <coughs> his term of life will be prolonged, he will have abundant wealth, and people will love him. His family will love him. This is the hadith on Hassan. So at the beginning, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is an author. He says, Man ittaqa rabbahu, which is am, which is general and includes everything. You fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many different ways. But he mentions something more specific than after that. So this is dhikr al-khas ba'd al-an. Okay, this is uh, an Arabic kind of way of speaking that you will mention something general and then you will mention specific things concerning that what was mentioned general because of its importance. Okay, so for example, if somebody says to you, study your exams. Okay, study for your all, study for your exams. And study maths and English and science. Okay, now, what does that mean? What I mentioned at the beginning is something am, something general, includes all exams. But I mentioned that the next three subjects, which comes under what I've already mentioned, but because of their importance, there's a special emphasis concerning them. Okay, so make sure you study for your exams and make sure you study for English, maths and science. I'm not talking about something else, but it just shows the importance of what is being mentioned after that. So here three things are mentioned. So whoever fears their Lord and maintaining ties of kinship, is that part of fearing your Lord? Yes, it is. Is um, no. So if a person does that, maintains his ties, then that person will have his life or her life prolonged, as we mentioned in the previous chapter. And he or her will have an abundance of wealth. As we've mentioned in the previous chapter. And here it mentions, وَأَحَبَّهُ أَهْلُهُ And that his people will love him. So this is something extra here. So Allah loves the one who maintains his ties or her ties of, of kinship. Now the very next narration is almost, it's the same hadith but just with a different isnad. Just from a, a different uh, a chain. So not only that a person who maintains their ties of, of kinship, that that may serve to extend their life, have more blessings in their risk, in their provisions, but also the people will love him or will love her. And as we we'll mentioned, and as has been already mentioned, that even if people are behaving towards you in a bad way, okay, that you should still do good towards them. Because this is what is an obligation upon you. And as we'll mention later, you will see, there are many ahadith talking about the same topic. But each one of those ahadith kind of 
give you a deeper and fuller understanding of the topic that we're talking about. And the way that you, not only the virtues of it, but how you can uh, actually manifest your, you know, maintaining your, your ties towards your, your relatives. And if a person who is maintaining the, the ties you know, towards their, their family members, mother, father, brothers, sisters, and you know, those who are uh, closer to you, and then uh, so on, that this will serve that people will love you. And this is al-qabool. This is uh, an acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That having love amongst the people, having acceptance amongst the people, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot pay whoever you are, whatever you have, regardless of the situation, you cannot place acceptance in the hearts of the people for you. You have to be a person who is a muttaqi. You have to be one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uphold the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to uphold what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed down. That you have to be an example for people to see. And once people see that you have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will, and, and they in turn are looking to have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place qubool, acceptance, and love in the hearts of the people for you. For this reason, for this reason, everyone who came in contact with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except, whom, except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Khatam ala qulubihim, who is then, who their hearts were sealed. That they would see him, and that by just merely seeing him, that they would love him, and that they would want to be with him, and you know, do everything that they possibly could for them, for him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because he was a person who had a link and a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like no other person. So, you know, when we read or think about things like that, about how the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, how they would, how they would love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and even on his passing alayhi wa sallam, how the companions, how, how they would, uh, how they reacted, try to imagine, try to imagine, if it is indeed possible to imagine, because maybe for some of us we haven't experienced any, experienced any great loss, of any very close relative of ours. But if a person has, then maybe they will have a great insight. Because the reality, none of us can realize or know the reality of what it was to lose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during that particular lifetime. We can never realize that. The closest possibility we could get is the most beloved person to us would be our mother. Okay, and you know, those who are very close to us. To lose one of those, the impact it would have on any one individual Imagine that the loss of Rasulullah sallallahu would be even more. Because uh, uh, he salam, was not only one whom they saw and recognized and knew, a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he had a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was beyond everybody. And not only that, that he maintained ties with everybody. He maintained ties with his neighbors alayhi salatu salam. Maintained ties with Whoever you can imagine that you should have a relationship with, mu'minuhum, muslimuhum, wa kafiruhum. The believer, the Muslim, and even the disbeliever. That he, alayhi salatu salam, recognized that every single one of them, that they had a right in, in one way or another. And that he, sallallahu alayhi salam, upheld those ties. Even though, may is not wajib for him to, for example, visit a non-Muslim, a Yehudi, a young child on their deathbed. Wajib, but he, alayhi salam, to save a soul. To save a soul, visited that individual, and, and even the father, even the father of that child said, Ati Abu Qasim. Obey and listen to Abu Qasim. This is the effect of maintaining relationships with people that you cannot imagine. But maintaining relationships with people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain a link with you. That you cut relations with people, those who are closest to you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut a relationship with you. And you cannot imagine the impact that that will be on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as we have just previously just spoke about, where the Rahim will complain against you, will speak against you that you cut ties of this person, this family member, and even will mention shortly where there was a person sitting in the presence of Abu Hurairah, 
radiyallahu anhu and Abu Huraira said whoever's cut any ties with anybody don't sit with us leave go 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 somewhere else or whoever's whoever's broken ties with any one of the members stand up and leave then one of the people stood up and then uh, he went to go and see one of his family they'd broken ties with for two years okay we'll come to that hadith shortly we'll, we'll explain it with him but the importance of maintaining ties of those who are closest to you and recognizing those who have a right over you. So that's chapter number 29. <clears throat> chapter number 30 is titled Being Dutiful to the Nearest Relative and Then the Next Nearest. And Al Miqdad ibn Ma'adi Karib, Ma'adi Karib. He narrated, or he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah enjoins you to be dutiful to your mothers, then he enjoins you, enjoins you to be dutiful to your mothers, then he enjoins you to be dutiful to your fathers, then he enjoins you to be dutiful to your next nearest relative, and then the next nearest relative. Now, the fact here, that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasizes kindness and respect towards the mother is because of the great status that the mother has in the life of every single one of us and in fact the book begins uh, with many narrations and many uh, chapter titles talking about the importance of the mother which if you were here from the beginning then uh, you know about that and then after that we mention uh, comes the father okay and we also mentioned that the, the clearly the strongest opinion, Wallahu ta'ala alam, is that the mother takes precedence, who has most right to righteousness, okay, uh, is the mother over the father. And we also mentioned, for those who weren't present, it doesn't mean, okay, we should you know, make that clear, that just because somebody has more right to being, you know, you uh, are righteous towards them, that the other person is not deserving of you being righteous towards them that never a time will come that you are righteous to one and not the other. The righteousness is due on, on both of them. So here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized the importance of being dutiful to those who are closest to you. They are first your mothers and then your father and then those who are closest to you in uh, regarding your relation your relatives rather there's an authentic hadith the next hadith which is the narration of Abu Ayyub Sulaiman the Mawla or the servant of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu he said Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu came to us on Thursday evening just like now the night of Friday. And he said, I oblige every individual who has severed ties of kinship to leave our company. No one left until he had said this three times. Then a young man went to one of his aunts, his paternal aunts, from whom he severed ties for the last two years. He went to her and she asked him, Yib, uh, Yib, uh, Yib Oh, my nephew, what has brought you here? He said, I heard Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu say such and such. She said, go back to him and ask him why he said that. Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the actions of the children of Adam are presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every Thursday evening, the night of Al-Jumu'ah. He does not accept the actions of someone who has severed the ties of kinship. There is um, it is said there's some issue with uh, the chain. However, we say there's a hadith from Hassan, and not only that. Moreover, we we do know of an authentic hadith, okay, which is in Sahih Muslim. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said تُعْرَضُ الْأَعْمَالِ That the actions are brought forth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Shown to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every Thursday and every Monday 
Okay, so we know that this part of the hadith it is is authentic. It is sahih. We also take the benefit of the benefits of majalis al ilm, the benefits of the sittings of of benefiting and then seeking knowledge. That here it is Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, I oblige everyone who has severed the ties of kinship to leave our company. That this is kabiratun min al kabair. This is a major sin. And that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wanted to, and it has a warning, he didn't want to be in the company of an individual who is cutting the ties of kinship with another family member. And that no one left. No one left that sitting until it was said three times. Then a young man felt it upon himself to go and visit his aunt, whom he had severed ties for two years. So he went to her and she was obviously taken aback, asking him, why are you here? Why did you come here? And he he said, I heard Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu say that whoever had cut ties, that they should leave. And this is from the benefits of sitting with the, you know, and sittings of knowledge that you hear something and it changes you for the better. There are times when, you know, you, you deliver a lecture or you deliver a benefit to somebody or you give somebody a piece of advice that they never knew before. Something as simple as how to make wudu, for example. Okay, make wudu. And then you correct them how to make wudu. That they, subhanAllah, their whole life they were making wudu in a particular way. They just took it for granted, this is how you perform wudu. But then you read to them a hadith of, for example, Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he performed wudu, and he said, radiallahu anhu, Uthman radiallahu anhu, said, this is how I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perform wudu. This individual never read the hadith, but rather just assumed that he just learned it from people. He just learned, you know, hands, face, nose, this and that and the other. That's all he or she learned but never actually read the hadith in any detail for him or her to perform it properly. For them to, them to hear that hadith, then to go away and then correct themselves. Not only have they bettered their ibadah, but the one who gave the advice, the one who's talking, they inshallah ta'ala will receive the reward for that good action that person is doing for the rest of their life. So it shows the benefit of uh, studying, it shows the benefits of, of sitting in the circles of knowledge. It also shows the importance of not being arrogant and not belittling one's sins. That somebody was asked to leave and eventually somebody did leave and immediately wanted to rectify that issue. So when this was brought to the attention of the aunt, she then asked him, where did he hear that? Where did you get that? What was said? And then he uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu mentioned or uh, stated the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And as I mentioned, there's a hadith uh, in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that I love uh, that my actions are presented while I am fasting. For that reason, it's good to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. The next hadith, which is the hadith, hadith number 62, is an author or narration of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, who said, What if a man spends on himself and his family anticipating a reward from Allah? Will not fail to be rewarded by Allah. You should begin with your immediate dependents. If there is something left over, you should spend it on your nearest relatives and then the next nearest. And if there's something left over, you can give it away to whom you think is more deserving. Um, there are two people in this narration, or in this, uh, the chain of this uh, narration, uh, who are da'if. So the chain is, is weak. However, there is an authentic hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which has a very similar wording to this. Okay, very similar wording to this. 
in which that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explains uh, told us about the person who spends on his family that the khayru sadaqa or khayru nafaqa or that the best that can be spent is what is spent ala ahlihi that what is spent on one's family and it is important that when the person it is a father for example or even uh, the mother spending on her children that they should make ihtisab that they should seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward and don't let it just become routine that, that it is an act of ibadah looking after those whom you have responsibility over okay, they seek the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when doing that and that those who have the most right uh, are those whom you have taken under your wing or those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in your care that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa informed us kullukum mas'ool kullukum mas'ool and an ra'iyyata that all of you are responsible and all of you are responsible for his flock as the man is responsible for his family and the wife is responsible for her husband's wealth and her home and his children so those who are closest to you have the most right for you to to look after so even though that there's a weakness in the chain in this narration of, of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, what is mentioned is authenticated or supported in that we have an authentic narration uh, narrated by Abu Hurairah uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu on that. And the next chapter, which is chapter number 31, is that mercy will not descend on people when there is someone among them who severs ties of kinship. Now this is a weak hadith, so we don't attribute it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, to explain the hadith in, in terms of a meaning, that mercy is not conferred on people when there is someone among them who severs ties or of kinship. Now we know we have a principle that no soul shall burden the sin of another person. Okay, each individual is responsible for their actions and if somebody is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, then I don't carry the sin for that okay so how would we explain this well some of the scholars have said that it is a person who is helping another person and not aiding him or her when or if they are qati al rahim if they are cutting ties of of uh, one of their relations uh, relation relatives so for example somebody says to you but yeah, I don't speak to this person, I don't speak to my mother, I don't speak to my father or my sister or whoever because of this issue. And then you say, yeah, yeah, you're right, you should cut ties with them, don't do that. You know, don't, don't go visit them, don't support them. And you're like you're helping them on them on this sin. Okay? So this is how the scholars would have, uh, would have explained it. Because even if, you know, a person is doing something wrong and I don't know about it, it's not my responsibility. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take me into account? about sins that other, other people are doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لا يظلم مثقال ضرر That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress uh, a mustard, you know, a mustard seeds of, of anything or towards anybody. Yeah. Chapter number 32 is the sin of someone who severs the ties of kinship. This is the narration or the hadith of Jubayr ibn Mut'im radiallahu anhu that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying لا يدخل الجنة قاطع الرحم that the one who severs the ties of kinship will not enter the Jannah authentic hadith so the one who severs or cuts the ties of kinship will not enter al Jannah the paradise now Imam al nawi rahimahullah, uh, explains this hadith. And he said, this hadith is given two explanations. The first one is referred to, i.e. that the one who declares the severing the ties of kinship as legitimate, that you can do that. It's allowed. It's allowed for you to cut the ties of uh, your relatives. It's halal. It's okay. Okay, the one who does that and says that لا يدخل الجنة will not enter the Jannah. 
as long as we said that the person makes that halal and even after al-hujjah even after the proof has been brought to that person it has been made clear to them yet still they reject it okay with arrogance they still reject I don't care about these evidences you're allowed to do it okay, this is a problem As he says, Rahimahullah, Imam Noor, such a person is a disbeliever who will remain in the fire forever and will never enter the Jannah. The second meaning is that the one who severs the ties of kinship will not enter the Jannah. I.e. that means that that person who breaks the ties of kinship will not enter the Jannah with the first people. That they will have a punishment for that. They will not go with the first people entering the Jannah. That they rather they will be delayed. And they're delaying, of course, of course, as a form of punishment. They're delaying in being entered into the Jannah will be a form of punishment. Because as we know, every believer will eventually enter the Jannah. It may not be straight away, it may not be straight away, but eventually they will, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And we know that even the last person, which is Hadith Sahih Muslim, the last person to enter Al Jannah, after spending an amount of time in the hellfire, that they will crawl out of the hellfire and then walk along the banks to on, a, on the side of a river. And then they will see the gates of Jannah in the distance. Okay, the hadith is long. Point being that that person was in the hellfire and will eventually enter into the paradise. And no one will enter the Jannah except the Mu'minin, except the believers. Why do I say believers are not Muslims? I say that because a Muslim may be a Muslim in this life, that they present themselves as a Muslim, vahiram, what we see apparently, but within themselves that there is no iman. So they could be internally a munafiq. Okay, but we have to interact with one another as that they are Muslims. This is why we say that every mu'min will enter the Jannah in this sense. So no doubt this hadith shows the magnitude or the great punishment that a person may face if they sever the ties of kinship. The next hadith is hadith number 65 again is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ar-Rahim is derived from Ar-Rahman and it would say and this is similar to what a hadith we mentioned earlier my Lord, I have been wronged. My Lord, I have been cut off. My Lord, I have, and he, uh, the, the king, uh, the Rahim, he explains what has happened. My Lord, my Lord. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers, aren't you content that I cut off the one who cuts you off and I maintain time, maintain ties with the one who maintain, who maintains ties with you? Here again, we explained that here the Rahim here speaks kalam al haqiqi. It is a real speech. And we don't make ta'wil of it, we don't explain it away, it is metaphorical in any way. But here the kinship counts and, uh, and speaks about the wrongs and uh, what happened towards it and that it suffered. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes clear uh, that the one who cut the ties of kinship, that they would be cut off. And one maintains it, maintains it would maintain times, maintain times with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's something you mentioned before. And this will be the last hadith we take today, inshaAllah. <clears throat> the narration of Sa'id ibn Sam'an, he said, I heard Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu seeking refuge from the rule of a young, of the young and the foolish. Up to here, Sahih. Okay, this part of the hadith narration is authentic. But I, I heard Abu Huraira seeking refuge from the rule of the young and the foolish. The remaining part, and I'll read it now, Sa'id ibn Sumran said, Ibn Hassan al Juhani told me that he asked Abu Huraira what would be the token of such rule. He said, Then the ties of kinship will be severed, those who misguide 
when he says, what is uh, the token of such rule? I will have the signs of such rule. He said, then the ties of kinship will be severed. Those who misguide people and will be obeyed and those who guide rightly will be disobeyed. This is weak because this individual called Ibn Hassan al Juhani la yu'raf. He's an unknown person. We don't know who he is. So it is the, the, this last part cannot be authenticated. Nonetheless, the first part of it where Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu sought refuge from Imara. Imara means that somebody's given a position over others of the young and the foolish. Imarat al-Subyan was sufaha Because of their youngness, because of their uh, immature behavior, because of their lack of wisdom, that he, radiallahu anhu, sought refuge from such people. Because such people should not be given, not unless, excuse me, not unless that they are suitable to be given that responsibility. Now somebody, in our day now, will say, did not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam choose young people to lead an army? Did not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam choose young people to take positions? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. Did choose, but these were Sahaba. These were Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And don't, I mean, we should not, of course, compare ourselves to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So the fact that we have Khairul Bashar, the best of men and the Prophet والسلام, choosing from the best of companions is not necessarily something to say, well, you know, look at me, I'm going to choose this young pup to be in charge of, I don't know what. Okay, because it may cause more friction and more problems for, you know, uh, for all of us. For this reason, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he saw refuge from the rule of the young and the foolish. The remaining part, the young here is the, the immature people. They would lack wisdom and, and emotional balance. Okay? And this is usually associated with, with adult people. No. The last part uh, of the narration, which we do not authenticate, nonetheless, we say that what are the signs of such rules? And it says that the ties of kinship would be severed. Okay? Which may be a sign of, of the young not being wise in the advice that they're giving. Okay, not understanding the importance of the situation, that those who misguide people will, will be obeyed. Okay, those who misguide people, those who have a lack of knowledge, which no doubt is sahih. Okay, those people who have a lack of knowledge, who don't know very much, but they will mis misguide people, give people wrong information. And we can see in our day now that these people are listened to. And that those people who are guide, who guide rightly, and guiding rightly means that they have knowledge, they have ilm, they have wisdom, that they will be disobeyed, that they will be cast aside. So the uh, the boundaries or the lines between those who have knowledge and those who don't have any knowledge maybe becomes unclear to many people. So we don't know who are the people of knowledge and who are the, who are you know who's the people who are who don't have any knowledge. Manadid, we don't know, but whoever speaks the loudest. Whoever has the most likes, whoever has the most followers, whoever has the most uh, extrovert, uh, you know, on, on their videos or their advices that these people are listened to, okay, and that those people who are not so loud or those people who don't look as uh, as trendy or you know don't look as uh, well, they're not my age. They don't know my you know what we're going through. Okay, this is how they viewed me. They're the belittle. Okay, these kind of things. That they're not listened to. Okay? And this is something in the this is something, you know, in reality that we are facing now, no doubt. That, um, uh, this is almost like a rerun for a lecture I want to give. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it another time. Uh, however, uh, the point being that, uh, there's a, a big danger that we're going through at the moment that our, uh, our youth have never experienced life, uh, without Facebook. Okay, they they don't know life without social media. They only know life with it. That's all they know, and all they know are about people who put themselves in front of a screen 
uh, whether it's on their phone or their laptops or their computers or their tablets, whatever the case may be, that they seem to know what they're talking about, so they must know what they're talking about. Okay? And because that the uh, social platforms are saturated with these people, that so many people that you know one of them must be right. So why don't I listen to all of them? Okay, so this is a great danger. It's a great danger. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protect us all. So here we'll stop in Shalawat Taala and we'll continue next week. Bismillah. Wallahu Taala Alam. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Subhanallah. 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 Subhanallah.